Good afternoon, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins 30-minute COVID-19 briefing, where we provide live insights from the experts who lead our work at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. For the next half hour, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic and public health responses. As a reminder, we offer these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm part of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time, so please submit your questions in the box at the bottom of your screen. Today, I'm joined by two guests. First, Dr. Brian Garibaldi, who's the director of the Johns Hopkins Biocontainment Unit and an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Brian will give an update about the treatment of COVID patients. Then we'll hear from Dr. Bill Moss, who is executive director of the Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Bill will give an update on COVID-19 vaccines. I'll now turn to each of our speakers for a brief overview. Brian, we've been hearing for weeks that COVID hospitalization numbers are down throughout the US. Is that reflected by what you're seeing in the hospital? How have things changed for you with the waning of the Omicron surge? Well, Lainey, you know, the sun's out, spring is here, and I think there's there's a lot of hope or at least cautious optimism that we're on the other side of, of the worst of certainly this surge, but hopefully uh, future surges of the pandemic. You know, here in Maryland, cases are way down. At the height of the Omicron surge, we had over 3,000 hospitalized patients in the state. As of this morning, there were less than 200 patients who were hospitalized, and I think that's certainly reflected in our hospital, where um, you know we're down to only a few dozen patients um, with COVID, um, and we're able to handle those patients in the dedicated airborne isolation rooms that we had for other diseases that existed before COVID. And what's that? What that's meant from from a hospital standpoint is that you know activities, elective procedures, our ability to take care of patients with other diseases has really opened up. Uh, and those procedures are moving forward. We, we are still experiencing staffing issues across the board, you know, particularly in nursing, but you know, all different uh, staffing areas of the hospital, much like most industries um, after the pandemic. But what we're not seeing anymore is we're not seeing widespread call outs because people are sick with COVID, which is a, a you know, wonderful uh, change over the last few months. Uh, of the patients who are coming into the hospital, most are either unvaccinated or those who didn't mount an effective response to the vaccine, usually that's because they, they had an underlying uh, immune system condition or on medications that prevented their immune system from mounting an effective response. Um, but we do occasionally see people who are hospitalized who didn't get boosted, they were vaccinated or didn't get boosted. Um, on the therapeutic fronts, we, we have expanded access to outpatient therapies, uh, such as oral antiviral therapies like Paxlovid and also monoclonal antibodies, uh, Citromabab still uh, retains its effectiveness against uh, Omicron, and there are other uh, monoclonals that are becoming uh, available on the market. So I would say that there's cautious optimism here, and that's reflected in some of the policies around many hospitals now where we're, we're still obviously wearing masks in clinical spaces, but for the first time in two years, masks are optional in non-clinical spaces. So in office settings where you, you're not going to encounter patients or their family members, uh, masks are now optional. Um, but I will say you know, the reason I said cautious optimism is, is that we do know that, that the BA2 variant is on the rise in the United States in terms of the percentage of new infections that are caused by BA2 in some areas, it's as high as 70% and that continues to rise. Um, we've had some encouraging data from overseas that it doesn't cause uh, more severe disease than the BA1 Omicron variant, but it may be more contagious. And I say maybe because you know, it's really hard sometimes to, to parse out the characteristics of the virus from the behaviors of individuals. So we've seen a rise in BA2 infections in Europe, for example, at a time when mask mandates indoors have gone away and, and uh, many other COVID restrictions have been relaxed. So it probably is a little bit more contagious, but it's also probably behavior that's driving that. Um, so I, I think we'll know in a couple of weeks if we're gonna see a significant rise in cases. Uh, of BA2 in the United States. Um, I don't think we're going to get to the point where it's going to overwhelm healthcare systems and lead to the, uh, the number of cases and deaths and hospitalizations that we saw over the winter. Uh, but I think, you know, that, that cautious optimism, I think we need to hold on for a couple more weeks to really see what happens here in the U.S. because we have been lagging behind Europe and most indices over the last, you know, by two to three weeks over the last couple of years. Um, yeah, the other thing that always 
think about, you know, there, there's still widespread transmission of COVID in other parts of the world. So Europe is seeing a surge of BA2. Hong Kong, obviously, is having its, one of its greatest surges. Their healthcare system is under a lot of strain. China is seeing the highest number of daily cases that they've ever had. Uh, Shanghai right now is reporting over 1,500 cases per day. And so while this virus is still circulating, it's still possible that a new variant could evade natural vaccine-induced immunity. So while right now we're relaxing restrictions in the United States, I think people need to, to, to be flexible. You know, while it may be okay to not wear a mask in certain situations right now, that, that may change depending on what happens with BA2 and certainly what could happen with other variants. And so I, I would just you know, pose this question to, to our viewership as I always do. You know, if you're, not, if you're not vaccinated yet, what are you waiting for? If you're not boosted yet, why not? Um, you know, even if you've already been infected, you know, there's, there's probably some protection against BA2 if you were infected with Omicron, but that's not true if you had been infected earlier on with other strains. Um, and the vaccines really do protect against severe disease, hospitalization, and death, uh, even though they don't protect as well um, uh, against symptomatic disease with these newer variants. Uh, so I would encourage you, you know, please get vaccinated if you're eligible. If, if you're already vaccinated, please get your booster, even if you were previously infected with COVID. Um, and I think doing those things will protect you, your family, your community, and hopefully keep us um, in this, you know, this wonderful spring where cases are down and, and life is, is getting back to some semblance of, of, of normal, if we dare use that word right now. Thanks, Brian. I, I, I think that might be the most optimistic I've ever heard you. <laughs> In about it might be the most optimistic years. I've been in about two years. So. Yeah. Um, before I turn to Bill, I want to remind our audience, please do submit questions for Brian and for Bill in the box that you see at the bottom of your screen. So, Bill, we're starting to hear more about a vaccine for children under age five, as well as the potential for a second booster or some folks are calling it a fourth. Uh, dose, at least for those who are immunocompromised. Could you speak to both of those developments um, as well as the global vaccination effort? Yes, thank you, Lainey. And I, I think Brian had today's uh, feel-good story, uh, despite his cautious optimism, which I completely agree with. Um, there is a there has been a lot of discussion about a fourth uh, a fourth dose or an additional booster dose. This has been stimulated by uh, requests first from bio, uh, Pfizer BioNTech uh, for a fourth dose for, to the FDA for adults older than 65 years of age. And then that was followed by a request uh, from Moderna to the FDA for adults older than 18 years of age. Um, so that has stimulated a lot of discussion and debate about the, the need for a fourth dose and, and for whom. I'll just start off by saying, picking up some of the points that uh, Brian laid out, you know, we still have close to one quarter of those eligible here in the United States uh, for vaccines who are unvaccinated. Um, and uh, that, that remains a, a real challenge going forward. Only about two thirds of the US uh, of those eligible in the United States are fully vaccinated. And only about half of those who are eligible for a third dose, uh, the first booster dose, have actually received it. So although we're talking about, you know, there's discussions around a, a fourth dose, a second booster, you know, th there's still a lot to be done in terms of getting those who are unvaccinated vaccinated and getting those who are eligible for booster doses to get a booster dose. And I realize that uh, the motivation to do so may be lower now as we see case counts go down um, and uh, the, some of the restrictions that are lifted, but it is still really important, as Brian said, and I'll just highlight, you know, the fact that what they're seeing, what Brian said they're seeing in the hospital are, are COVID patients who are either unvaccinated or immunocompromised. So the need for a first do fourth dose, I, I think in well, some part will depend on what our goal is. And I, along with many other experts, have, have continually stated that uh, our, our main goal is really preventing severe disease. Um, well, I think we were perhaps fooled a little bit by the, the very high vaccine efficacy and effectiveness uh, in, the, in the first few months, after, particularly after the mRNA vaccines, but also after the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, but our real goal is to prevent uh, severe disease. And as Brian said, the vaccines are holding up uh, really well uh, against uh, in preventing severe disease. There was a uh, uh, a recent study by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, that showed even during the, the Omicron uh, surge, 
that vaccine effectiveness against mechanical ventilation and death was about 80% after two doses and was up to 94% in people who have received three doses. It was lower uh, among those with underlying medical conditions that placed them at higher risk or were immunocompromising down to about 74%. But we're still, these vaccines are still holding up uh, against severe disease. So if that's our goal, um, then certainly, you know, I don't believe that everyone is going to need uh, an additional booster dose. Um, we have talked uh, and, and acted sometimes as if our goal were to prevent infections, all infections, but that's really an unreasonable goal, I think, for a vaccine. Um, so when I think about boost, uh, this fourth booster dose, I think about who, what, and when. Um, in terms of the, uh, the who, uh, which is a critical part, just to highlight that uh, individuals in the United States who are moderately to severely immunocompromised are already eligible for a fourth uh, dose uh, of uh, Pfizer, or one of our mRNA vaccines. Um, however, those only make up about 3% of the population. Um, I think what we'll see, um, at least uh, is certainly in terms of the debate, is uh, you know whether, or the question in my mind, is whether other vulnerable uh, individuals, such as older adults, you know, uh, would they benefit from uh, from a fourth dose? In terms of the what, um, it, it's an interesting question. I think you know, obviously, the uh, the vaccine manufacturers are, are uh, making the argument that it should be with their with the current vaccines that, that they're making. But I think there is some interesting discussion. Will, will be had about you know, whether it should be an Omicron specific uh, booster, whether perhaps some of the newer, uh, not yet available protein-based vaccines would do a good job as a booster doses. I'm kind of excited about the intranasal vaccines, again, not yet available in the United States, but those may provide uh, more protection against uh, infection because uh, of it, they would induce mucosal immunity at the site uh, of virus entry. The when is a really difficult part. Um, ideally, we would time booster doses right before surges, but we don't always know when that's going to happen. Uh, there's been uh, some discussion that uh, perhaps in the fall and, and perhaps even combined with an influenza vaccine, although we don't yet know whether SARS-CoV-2 is going to play out as a seasonal respiratory virus, that might be a, a possibility. Um, and we'll just have to see going forward. My, my take is that uh, generally healthy uh, adults, younger adults, um, will not need uh, an additional booster dose and are quite well protected uh, against severe disease with two or even or three doses. Uh, and that that protection may last for many years. Um, uh, this on April 6, uh, the FDA Advisory Committee will meet to discuss these issues, to really discuss a U.S. COVID uh, uh, booster strategy. Um, it's not, I don't expect that they're going to weigh in at that time on the Pfizer uh, or Moderna actual proposals or uh, documents for authorization. Um, and it is interesting to see, uh, Lainey, you know, what other countries are doing. Is Israel has been uh, kind of out front in offering fourth doses to uh, a wider group of adults. Um, in England, they just began offering a second uh, COVID vaccine booster uh, just earlier this week to those who are particularly vulnerable. But some countries have been uh, ha have really widened it. Uh, for example, El, Sal El Salvador is offering a fourth dose uh, for uh, all individuals older than 12 years of age. As you mentioned, Lainey, there's also a lot of uh, discussion uh, and has been, and we've discussed it here before, about vaccine availability for children younger than five years of age. Um, I will highlight again that only about uh, a quarter of children between five to 11 years of age are fully vaccinated. So that's uh, our least uh, vaccinated age group. I anticipate that uh, that coverage will even be lower uh, among children younger than five years of age when vaccines become available. Uh, as we've discussed before, Lainey, you know, with the Pfizer vaccine, um, they've gone from a two dose to a three dose schedule. Hopefully those results will be available in early April so we can get a decision on the, on the three dose series for children younger than five with the Pfizer BioNTech. And then just, re just this past week, um, Moderna said that they're gonna seek emergency use authorization 
uh, for children younger than six years of age based on some of their uh, preliminary results. They looked at both immunogenicity, the antibody response, that looked good uh, in the younger children with their dose uh, of the vaccine um, compared to young adults. But vaccine efficacy was, was relatively low, um, less than 50%. Uh, it was about 44% in preventing symptomatic illness among children six months to two years of age, and slightly lower at 37% for children uh, two, two years through five years of age, um, but not, uh, I'll say not markedly lower than what we're seeing, uh, than what we saw during the Omicron surge uh, with, with, uh, with some of our current vaccines as well. Globally, um, more than 5 billion people have received one dose of vaccine. That's a truly remarkable accomplishment, and we, we should step back and reflect on that. It's about two-thirds of the world's populations, but we're still seeing uh, great inequities in vaccination with only about 15% of vaccines in low-income countries compared to about 80% in the high-income countries. Africa uh, continues to have the slowest vaccination rate of any continent, only about 20% of individuals uh, with, uh, residing within Africa, the continent of Africa, have received at least one dose. And I'll just end, Lainey, by uh, there's been some interesting discussion recently, although many of us have been thinking about this for a long time, uh, what some people have called the great COVID mystery as to why it appears anyway that mortality has been relatively low uh, in Africa compared to other places, with the exception of South Africa. Um, a recent uh, uh, study not yet published by the World Health Organization suggests, uh, using serological data, that about two-thirds uh, of people residing uh, in Africa uh, have evidence of, of infection uh, through serological testing. So it's not that infection hasn't happened there, but we just have not seen uh, the widespread, you know, or uh, marked increases in hospitalizations and deaths that we've seen elsewhere. Part of that may be under detection, but I, I just find it hard to believe that that those numbers of what we would expect uh, would not have been noticed uh, by colleagues in in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'll stop there, Lainey. Thanks so much, Bill. Lots of questions coming in as always. And so, Bill, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with you. First question concerns mm -hmm. vaccines for children under five. How, how do you think about Moderna looking at two doses, Pfizer looking at, at three doses? Like, is there some kind of a risk benefit calculation here? Mm -hmm. what, what do you think is going on? Yes, it, it really has to do, what's driving that is, uh, is the vaccine efficacy and, and the immune responses that are, that are uh, that are induced. So what happened? What's happening is that both companies have reduced the dosage, the amount of messenger RNA in their vaccines in younger and younger children, and that's a normal process um, where we uh, children are not just small adults; uh, they uh, m might need uh, you know smaller doses, and it's really weighing you know the how. A, protective the vaccine is or how uh, the immune responses that are induced against what we call the reactogenicity, uh, the, the soreness, the fever that we see shortly after uh, vaccine uh, uh, administration, although these are very transient. So the, the, the vaccine manufacturers are trying to balance this with the right dose. Um, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine may have gone a little bit too low uh, on their dosage. Um, and so in order to get uh, and improve the vaccine efficacy, they're going with a three dose. They started with a two dose schedule, just like Moderna. Now Moderna didn't quite go down quite as low uh, on, their, on that dosage, on the amount of mRNA. Their vaccines uh, they basically have more than the Pfizer. Um, and so we, we, the difference between the two dose, three dose schedule is really driven by that. They're trying to find this balance between what's sufficient amount of vaccine doses to protect the children, um, weighing, you know, these uh, transient side effects like fever or soreness. Thanks, Bill. Brian, question for you about um, so-called long COVID. What are you seeing in terms of patients? Um, does vaccination status seem to, to matter for those that, that have um, these long COVID symptoms? 
Sure. Well, you know, I think vaccination certainly matters because the best way to to eliminate or to reduce your risk of getting long COVID is to reduce your risk of getting infected in the first place. So obviously vaccine in and of itself is one way of, of protecting yourself against long COVID. Um, but it is also true that people who are vaccinated have a much lower incidence of developing long COVID. Um, you know, we have seen this, um, you know, people can develop symptoms post COVID independent of how severe their initial infection was. So it is possible for someone who's been vaccinated to get long COVID, but the incidence is probably, it depends, you know, the studies are still emerging. So it's probably a 30 to 50% reduction in the likelihood of developing long COVID if you were vaccinated and still happen to have a breakthrough infection. And, and I think the incidence is also gonna change based on um, whatever variant that you were uh, infected with. And that, that information is still sort of emerging. And again, you know, when we talk about long COVID, it's, I think it's important to remember that it's not just one thing, right? It's it's you know, there's the direct damage that the virus itself can do during an acute infection. So for example, the people that I see in the intensive care unit who develop scarring of their lungs and, and will have symptoms after COVID because of direct damage to their lungs. There are individuals who will have um, symptoms after their hospitalization that, that we know happens with other people who end up in the intensive care unit. People will have weakness, will have problems with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. But then there certainly are people who never were sick enough to be in the ICU who develop longer symptoms after their COVID initial infection is resolved. And, and I, I think those are really three distinct groups of patients, and there's going to be a lot of overlap between them. And I think it, it, it's a, a, a combination of who the individual is and what their immune system does in response to the virus. But there's probably also some virus-specific effects that we're going to have to tease out over the next few years to understand is there truly a difference in that incidence between which variant you were infected with and what that looks like moving forward, particularly as people develop both vaccine mediated immunity, but also natural immunity from, from prior infection. Thanks, Brian. Bill, I have a mix and match question for you. So for folks that have gotten um, an initial two dose series of Pfizer and then got a Pfizer booster, and now they're looking at a second um, booster, okay to get Moderna this time around? Yes, I, we don't have, we have, we don't have data on, on that, but I, th but it is, uh, I, I think one could get either of the mRNA vaccines uh, for that fourth booster. There would be no problem with that. And that's consistent with the current guidelines uh, from the CDC on, on booster doses. Um, I was trying to put forward that, you know, again, not yet available, but there may, there may be alternatives for the booster doses going forward. Not, not at this time, but going forward. Thanks, Bill. Brian, question for you about the BA2 variant. Are, are, are you seeing much of this or, or hearing from colleagues throughout the country about this variant among patients? Brian, I think we lost your audio. Sorry, after two years, you think I would know to unmute. Um, so we definitely are seeing cases of BA2, um, but we're not seeing very many cases at all right now of, of uh, COVID, particularly coming into the hospital. Um, but we know that of new infections in some parts of the country is up to 70% um, in terms of new infections. And certainly that's what colleagues in Europe have been seeing. They've been seeing predominantly BA2 infections. Um, again, the, the data so far that's come out of, of Europe in particular has not shown BA2 to be more severe in terms of the, the uh, types of infections that people are getting. Um, the epidemiologic data suggests that it is more infective, um, and there are some studies looking at household contacts of people who are infected with BA2 compared to people infected with BA1, and people who had BA2 were more likely to spread that infection to household contacts. But again, it's really difficult to, um, at this point, parse that out from changes in behavior, right? Because the way the virus moves and, and infects other people is also dependent upon our behavior. And as indoor mask mandates have gone away largely in, in most parts of the world, that's been coupled with the increase in, in the number of infections with BA2. So I, I think it probably is more infectious, but how more infectious it is, unclear at this point. Um, it does not look like it causes more severe disease. Um, Thanks, Brian. Bill, Request for you to elaborate a bit on um, what waning immunity after a third dose or a, a booster dose means. Yes, and this is a really important question, Lainey, because we use that term waning immunity, but it, it does require some unpacking. 
And the way I think about it uh, is that there, we basically have two arms of our immune system. We have the antibody response and we have our what we call our cellular immune response. And uh, after immunization, both arms uh, uh, or, or infection, both arms are stimulated, but they're, they're doing somewhat different things and the, and the waning is different for both. So what happens is uh, after an mRNA vaccine, we get these very high levels of neutralizing antibodies. And those, uh, if they're high enough, can actually you know, really prevent infection and prevent uh, mild disease. And that's what we see. But those antibody levels are not maintained at that very high levels uh, for more than you know, a couple months, three to four months, let's say. Um, and then those antibody levels go down. And that's part of our normal immune system. If those antibody levels stayed up, uh, very high, our, our blood would soon kind of get thick with antibodies. So that's that's the waning part. It's really referring to this uh, kind of decline in these neutralizing antibodies over time that put us at higher risk of uh, of mild infection or, or uh, perhaps even moderate infection. But it's the cellular immune response that really uh, kind of kicks in a little bit later. That's really what's probably driving the protection against severe disease. And that looks to be very stable. We've seen some decrease uh, over time in that, but it remains pretty high. So I think when we're talking about waning immunity, we're largely speaking about uh, these, these antibody levels uh, that come down, um, but the cellular cell mediated immunity that's conferring protection against severe disease is really staying. And my sense is going to be that that's going to last for years, probably. Thanks, Bill. And you're getting the last word today because we're just about at time. So I'd like to thank Brian Garibaldi and Bill Moss for joining me. Give a big thank you to everyone who joined us and especially to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. As always, this briefing will be archived and available on coronavirus.jhu.edu. As a reminder, we will continue to offer these 30-minute briefings on Fridays this year. Until our next briefing in April, thanks and stay safe.